Today we're going to have a look at a relatively new tool that Unity's introduced called the Memory Profiler. Now this is a new feature, it's not the same as the legacy profiler that comes built in with every install of Unity. Unity actually has some pretty good videos that give a high level overview of what this tool can do, but there aren't really any videos showing you how to use it to solve real problems. So today we're going to create a real problem and then use this tool to highlight how you would identify that problem with the memory profiler. On top of that, we're gonna write a little bit of code so that we can hook into the API of the memory profiler and programmatically take memory snapshots at key points in our game. So let's get right into it. Let's start by installing the package. If we come into the package manager under Unity Registry, we can search for memory. Then we just click install and it just takes a couple seconds and we'll be up and running. So the main benefit of this tool is that you don't need to have an in-depth knowledge of memory to be able to effectively optimize your app. We'll take a snapshot here right away so that you can see just how easy it is. But first, let's take a look at some settings. If I jump up into Preferences under Analysis Memory Profiler, here you'll see we have just a few options. The most important one probably is the first one, is where are we going to actually save our snapshots so that you can find them on your file system later. The rest of these settings are really cosmetic. So let's move on to get our first snapshot. Uh, so I've loaded up this garden scene from the URP sample. So I'm going to go into play mode here and then come up to window and then under analysis, I'm going to select memory profiler. So that'll bring up a new window with this tool. And there's a couple ways you can take snapshots. The main one is this button right in the middle here, capture new snapshot. It's going to have to do a little bit of processing, but then we'll suddenly have our snapshot appear on the left side here and we can select it and suddenly start seeing all kinds of information about this particular point in time. Here you can click on any one of these little things inside the main middle window there and then on the right side it's going to give you a breakdown on what this information actually means. Now as I mentioned before you don't have to be a memory expert to get something out of this information. In fact if we scroll down a little bit you'll see top unity object categories. This is where you're going to find a lot of the things that you're going to be able to optimize to make your game have a smaller memory footprint. You can click on the inspect button here or you can select unity objects from the top tab and you'll get an even more detailed breakdown of which things in your game are actually taking up the most memory. Here in this URP sample project we can see it's the textures. We can even break it down by which textures in particular. So this way you'll be able to know what the big offenders are. You can go back into your game, optimize those things and then take another snapshot and see how well your optimization performed. Now, another great use of this tool is to be able to detect memory leaks. So I want to build two things in code today. The first one is just a little bit of code that'll simulate a memory leak. But the other one is I don't want to be coming over to the memory profiler and clicking that button every time I want a snapshot. So we're going to create a small service that will allow us to take snapshots programmatically at key points during our gameplay. So I was thinking the best way to simulate a memory leak would be to create a class that just creates a static list of textures. Let's create a whole bunch, let's say 300. We're going to put all the textures that we create into this static list. Now the static list, of course, isn't tied to any particular scene. If I switch from one scene to another, Unity is going to try to unload all the unused resources. But of course, our textures are still going to be referenced by this static list and they're not going to get unloaded. This is a classic memory leak. So I'll just add a little comment here saying what I'm doing and then maybe when we're done adding all the textures we can also debug something out to the log. Just a little something that says we are finished creating all the textures and this is how many there were. And then I can see Riders prompting me to make this read only which might as well do that. We're going to come back to this class in a moment and add some code to actually take a snapshot before we create all these textures so that we know what the memory footprint looked like before we had this massive memory leak. So I mentioned we're going to swap scenes to test this out and make sure that uh, all our textures are still in memory, even in the other scene. To do that, let's make another class here. I'm just going to call it scene loader. We'll make it the simplest thing ever. But first, let's put it into its own file so that we can use it in Unity. Scene loader doesn't need too much. I've actually created two scenes already that are just empty in Unity. And the second one is called test scene. So in the update method, let's just wait for key press down key one and we will load the test scene. So we're going to start from a basic example scene and we'll come over to the test scene after that. If a single mode scene is loaded, Unity calls resources.unload unused assets automatically. So let's move on to actually build our memory snapshotter service. This will be the bulk of the code in today's video, so I'm going to move this into its own file and we'll start working on it. 
Let's start up at the top with some dependencies. We'll put in the usual suspects, of course, but I also want to add using unity.profiling and using unity.profiling.memory. And one more, I want unity.collections.lowlevel.unsafe. And that's because we're going to be using the native array data structure later on in this class. I'll just collapse these up so they're not taking up so much room. Now, I was thinking we could name our snapshots in the same format that Unity does. So why don't we take a look at the snapshot we took earlier on the file system and see how that looks. So you can see it just says memory profiler underscore and then it has a timestamp. Now, you don't have to stick with this format, but it will show the snapshots in sequential order in the profiler. So why don't we avoid magic strings and let's make some constants here for the folder name, the prefix of each file, the extension of the snapshot, and the extension of the screenshot that we're going to take for each one. Beyond that, we might as well cache the actual path to the folder. We'll set that in a moment. And we can also set the snapshot name and the screenshot name as soon as we've generated a timestamp for a particular snapshot. So in the constructor here, let's get a reference to the entire project path. And then we can derive from that where we're going to store our memory captures. Now, it is possible that this is going to be the first capture put into that folder. Maybe the folder doesn't exist. Let's check that. If the folder doesn't exist yet, let's create it. Okay, great. We're ready to take some snapshots. So let's come down a little bit and create a new public method that we'll just call take snapshot. As soon as we call this method, let's capture a timestamp that we can use. From here, we have a good idea now what we're going to name our two files. So we can say the snapshot path is going to be the memory path, and then we'll combine the prefix, timestamp, and the extension together. And we can do a similar thing for our screenshot. So now we're into the heart of it. Memory Profiler also has a public method take snapshot. And what we're doing here is we're wrapping that method so that we can pass in parameters and callbacks to it. The first argument here, of course, is the full path to where we want to save that snapshot. Then we have two callback methods. The first one is what do we want to have done when the snapshot is finished? The second one is optional, and that is going to be what do we want to do if we've captured a screenshot? The only thing I'll say about this is that capturing the screenshot is a little bit more resource intensive. So if you want it to run faster, just forget about that. It's just a convenience so that you can see thumbnails in the memory profiler. So you can call it with just these two arguments. Me personally, I prefer to see the thumbnails there, so I'm gonna leave it in. So let's start with the first callback. It's actually really straightforward. You don't have to do anything special, but it does send you back a little bit of information that you could do something with if you wanted to. So the main one is it's going to tell you if it was successful or not with this result argument. Let's just use that argument to say whether we were successful or not. And that's really all we have to do that, you know, Unity is going to take care of saving that file for you. It's done. The screenshot capture is a little bit more complex, so let's work on that next. This callback actually takes three arguments. Let's define it right up here. So the first one, or the first two, are just like the other one. We get the path and the result, but it also comes with this debug screen capture data structure. So like our other callback, we can do something with the result, which will be we're going to want to save this screen capture to the file system. We'll make another method for that. If it failed, let's put out an error message just like we did with the other callback. Well, let's come up here just a little bit and we'll define the signature for the save screenshot method. But before we fill it out, I want to go and take a closer look at this debug screen capture data structure. It references a native array, which is this raw image data reference. Let's have a look. So this is a struct that's defined in the unity.profiling namespace. And at the top of the class here, you can see this property is a native array of type byte. And this is what we're going to get our actual screenshot data out of. So let's come back into our class and make use of that. If we come down here to a new line, I want to take that native array and turn it into a managed array so that we can actually use it in the broader scope of C sharp.net features. Let's handle all of that in a new separate static method. So here we'll just accept the native byte array and let's declare a new byte array that's the same size as the native array. So here I'm going to be using the unsafe keyword. And what this does is it allows for the use of pointer types and operations so that we can directly read and potentially also write directly to memory. In order to use the unsafe keyword in a Unity project, we actually have to turn it on in settings. Let's jump back to Unity. If we come up into project settings under player and you scroll all the way to the very bottom here, there's a few checkboxes near the end. And from the second one here, it says allow unsafe code. Just make sure that's checked on. Next, I'm going to introduce the fixed statement. 
So the fixed statement prevents the garbage collector from relocating a movable variable. The garbage collector won't move the variable that the destination pointer points to, so the address will remain valid within the scope of this particular statement. Now we can use the buffer.memoryCopy method to actually get all the bytes from the native array, copy them into the destination array, and then at the end, we can just return our managed array. It now has the same information as the native array. Okay, now that the hard part is done, let's finish up our save screenshot method. First, let's create a new texture 2D that's going to hold this new representation of our screenshot. Then we can use the load raw texture data method to accept that image data from our new managed array, and we'll just load all that information onto the texture. And then, of course, we need to call the apply method on that texture as well. So now we've got a texture that's representing our screenshot. Let's encode that to PNG. So that's going to go into a new array of bytes. And with this, we can actually write this to the screenshot path. When we're finished with the screenshot texture, let's just immediately destroy it. OK, there we go. We've got a service that will take memory snapshots for us. Now, we actually need to make a few adjustments to the other scripts just to make sure that they're actually taking screenshots at the appropriate times. So on our memory leak simulator where I left that comment, let's just make sure that we're actually taking a snapshot there. Now, you probably want to pass the memory snapshotter in as a dependency or cache it somehow, but this is just for the demo. So we'll do it like this. And now when I load the test scene, I also want to take a snapshot as soon as that scene is finished loading. Everything's loaded up and start methods are starting to get called on different mono behaviors. So let's create a new one for this. All this one does is in the start method, takes a snapshot. And we'll be able to put that on a component in our second scene. Let's move this off into its own file. And I have just one more thing to do. If I come back to my service, I made one mistake here. The path that is being sent into our save screenshot method is actually a path to the memory snapshot, not the screenshot. So let's take that path, change the extension on it so that it becomes our screenshot path. And then I need to replace that variable here. So it's using the correct path for saving the screenshot. And actually, if I come up to the top of the class, we don't need to cache the reference to that screenshot path anymore. We're just deriving it from the one that's passed in. So clean that up a little bit. Now we're ready to go and do a little demo. So I'm going to put away this garden scene and I'm going to actually open up one of the, the first test scene that I made. That's really just an empty scene. So I actually called it empty scene. Let's open that up. And there's nothing in here except the camera and the directional light, but I'll create an empty object and I'll just call it test. So this needs our memory leak and it also needs our scene loader. So let's start with the memory leak here. It's called memory leak simulator. So that'll create our 300 textures. And then I need the scene loader that'll actually flip over to the other scene. So that's great. Let's find the test scene and jump over to there. And just need to save this quickly and then we'll open this up. So this one will need a snapshotter on start. I'll just give it a simple name here, start snapshotter. And we just have to add that component to it. Okay, as soon as that's finished, all we really have to do is press play and that'll get our first, well, it'll load up all our textures for us and then it will take our first screenshot. So come back to the empty scene and press play. Now we should see some messages pretty quickly in the console. Sure enough, it saved the snapshot. Then it immediately created the 300 textures and then we can see the message about saving our screenshot. So obviously these two callback methods aren't necessarily immediate, but you can see they did get called and did do their work. Now, if I change scenes by pressing the one key and come over to the test scene, sure enough, right away, it saves a snapshot and saves a corresponding screenshot for it. Now let's jump over to the memory profiler and have a look at what we've actually captured. So I've selected compare snapshots on the top left corner. And if I click on the first one, it'll load it into the first section and I can click on the other one and that'll load it as the one to compare with in the second section. So once these are both loaded up, now you can see we've got some side by side data of everything. And if you look at the purple area right in the middle of the screen, this, according to the legend, represents all of our graphics. And of course, in our second screenshot, after we introduced the memory leak, it's a lot bigger. Now, all of your memory leaks might not look this obvious, but uh, they definitely will show up. And if we come over to Unity Objects, you'll see they're ranked by size difference and Texture 2D is right at the top of the list. Now, we didn't give any of these textures names, so they're listed as no name, but you can see there are 
basically 300. Now, if you look in the columns here, you'll see that in scene A, there were three textures to begin with. Then we created a whole bunch more and somehow got rid of one to only have 302 in the second scene. So you can see they all have IDs and whatnot. That's not super helpful to you, but the fact that you can see these objects potentially even by name, if we had named the textures, then uh, you would be able to find them quite easily in this list and determine what it is exactly that's causing the problem. So in this list, you're not just going to see texture 2Ds. You're going to see game objects, transforms, mono behaviors, uh, render textures, just about anything that's going to be created by you in your game. And you'll be able to say, okay, clearly this huge orange bar here or on the first screen, that massive purple section means something is going sideways and I need to figure it out. Now, another thing you can do with the code that we just wrote is you can hook it up to our improved timer system that we made a few videos ago so that you can actually have a snapshot captured every, say, five minutes, every 10 minutes as you're playing. That way, if you're playing through a level, you'll be able to have these snapshots that very clearly show the difference between one point and another. And these diff views that you see here in the memory profiler, they're only gonna show you the objects that have changed between point A and point B. So you're not gonna see every single thing when you're doing a comparison. It'll really narrow it down for you and you'll really be able to isolate what's changed between these two points and how can I optimize things better or how can I fix a problem that is happening. Another really good idea is to always take a snapshot at the beginning of any sort of level change or maybe you're coming out of your main menu into your gameplay scene. Take a snapshot so that you have a baseline going forward you can compare anything. So even if you're manually taking snapshots through the memory profiler interface, you'll still have that baseline snapshot that you can compare to. Any questions about the memory profiler or about the legacy profiler, which we'll cover in a future video, please leave in a comment below. We're definitely going to cover more optimizations and profiling in future videos. So if you don't want to miss that, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and I'll see you in the next one.